This is the fourth in a four parts uh, series of interviews about Canada's national emissions. And I'm going to be talking to Brian Livingston, who's an executive fellow at the School of Public Policy, the University of Calgary. He's written an intelligence memo for the CD Howe Institute titled Counting Carbon, a reality check on our emission reduction plan. We've uh, in previous interviews, we've dealt with transportation oil and gas and buildings. And now we wrap it up with basically the rest of the economy. So welcome to the interview, Brian. Glad to be here. Okay, give us the uh, a brief overview, if you don't mind. Well, uh, Mark, and this is what uh, a boss of mine used to call the dreaded other. There are five sectors left. And when we go through them, it'll be a bit like uh, me being a sportscaster and reporting the scores of last night's games. So I'll just go through the numbers and and give you a brief commentary. The five sectors, and we'll go through them one by one, uh, they uh, constitute, in 2019, constitute emissions of about 272 million tons, which is about 35 or 40% of Canada's total. The forecast using the various, uh, using the model that I put together says that'll go down to 176 versus a target of 146 million tons that the uh, government has put out in its emissions reduction plan that it put out in March of last year. Okay, well, let's uh, deal with the first one, which is heavy industry. Uh, in 2019, it had emissions of 77 megatons. The forecast, your forecast is for 62 megatons and the target is for 52. So a shortfall of 10, can you explain that? Yeah, the heavy industry are things like steel mills, pulp and paper mills, petrochemicals facilities, cement factories, to name the four biggest ones. There is some uh, capacity for, uh, for a reduction through electrification. Steel mills in particular, steel mills use, used to use natural gas to heat up steel to make it molten steel, like those old pictures you see in photographs of, of molten steel being poured out of giant bat, bats. Uh, there's been a couple of announcements. One at, uh, I still call it DeFasco in Hamilton, the company that formerly was DeFasco, uh, and also Algoma, which is in Sault Ste. Marie, which will reduce 3 million tons each by electrifying their furnaces instead of using natural gas. And that got a lot of political play. Uh, both the prime minister and I believe the premier of Ontario were present when the announcements to, uh, in, to make these investments were made about six months or so ago. Uh, cement is difficult. Cement is actually emissions not from combustion, which is how most CO2 carbon dioxide is created, but rather through the chemical process of actually making a cement. But there are some things they can do. There's some things pulp and paper can do, some things that uh, mines can do. And so that gets you the 15 million uh, ton reduction from the 77 to the 62. But not everything that the government has targeted, in my forecast, will happen. It sounds like carbon capture and storage might be a, a future solution for those hard to decarbonize uh, sectors uh, in the, hard, the heavy industry one. And hydrogen is also being floated as a potential fuel to replace natural gas. That is true. Uh, industrial processes are more uh, lend themselves more to hydrogen because you've got it concentrated in one place. You're not moving around like you are in trucks or other vehicles. And you can put in storage facilities to store the hydrogen right on site. Uh, the cement part is difficult because the CO2 that comes out of cement is diffuse. And any engineer will tell you that capturing a diffuse amount of uh, CO2 in an atmosphere is more difficult than capturing a concentrated amount of uh, CO2 that's in flue gas in a combustion facility. So yes, you're right. Some of that could happen, but there's still challenges for things like making of cement. Well, let's talk about electricity. And, and this is interesting because Canada's electricity system is already 80 to 82 uh, uh, percent zero or low emissions, mostly thanks to hydro and to nuclear, which make up, I think, about about well, almost 77 percent, 78 percent. And the rest would be wind and solar. Um, but the, the challenge here is that we also have to scale up electricity uh production, generation, and distribution as we electrify parts of the economy. And I wonder, Brian, if that is going to present a challenge for the industry to finish phasing out coal, which is produces most, and, and natural gas, I guess, uh, which is where the emissions come from in this sector. Let me talk about that. The three provinces that emit still the most emissions, and you're absolutely right, I think 82 or 84% of Canada's electricity is emission-free right now. Uh, 
The uh, most of it is in three provinces: Alberta, Saskatchewan, and, and Nova Scotia. Alberta, if you went to their grid ten years ago, almost half, if not half, came from coal-fired emissions. That's very similar to what it was in the United States ten years ago, where most of their electricity came from coal-fired emissions. The engineers got to, uh, their plan together and said, "Listen, we can change and convert." those coal-fired facilities to natural gas-fired facilities. The good news about that is, A, they're more thermally efficient. I took thermodynamics in my engineering class. And the thermal efficiency, i.e. the amount of electricity that you get out per 100 units of, of heat put in through natural gas or coal is better for natural gas than it is for coal. So there's a win there. It's a lot cleaner. There's no what they call particulate or soot that goes up the, uh, the flue stack in coal. Uh, there is none of that in natural gas. And so you've seen Alberta convert in a big, big way in the last six years from coal to natural gas. And they're well on their way and will likely have completely converted or phased out coal completely by about 19, uh, sorry, by 2026, about four years, by three or four years from now. Saskatchewan, not quite as much. They still have more coal, but they are in the process of phasing out some of their coal. And uh, Nova Scotia is doing the same. For natural gas, <coughs> excuse me, natural gas, you're right. You mentioned carbon capture. Natural gas fired electrical facility is perfect for carbon capture. You've got a flue gas going up the stack. You can capture the five to 15% of CO2 in the flue gas very easily and inject it underground. So for all with all those things, that's why the, the electricity is actually probably the best news in all of these emissions. Currently we have 61 million tons. That's gonna go down to 18, which is very, very close to the 14 million tons target. So that's probably the best news story of all of these. Well, uh, we haven't had a lot of good news in the interviews we've been doing so far. Canada is looks like it's going to have a, a hard time hitting its target. So at least we have one sector uh, that will be close. Good for us. Um, the, the, the third uh, sector in this interview is about agriculture. Where are we at with farming? Well, farming, again, the emissions there are methane and nitrous oxide, not carbon dioxide. Those are still considered to be greenhouse gases. And as you've said earlier in these interviews, methane potentially, uh, actually more than potentially, has a, an effect of something like 20 or 25 times as much effect as a, a equivalent unit of CO2. The methane, frankly, comes mostly from animals. Uh, it's all jokes aside, most of it is because of uh, cows that uh, are converting grain into milk as they have their chewing their cud, to, to use an expression I learned as a kid. And uh, burping cows, if I can use that term, uh, causes a significant amount of, of, of uh, methane emissions, maybe even a little bit at the other end, but I won't talk about that here. This is a family show. Uh, the other okay. part is, is nitrous oxide. That comes from fertilizers. Uh, for farmers, if they were here, say, yep, Brian, we put fertilizers on fields to enhance the yields of crops so we can grow more food and feed more people at a lower price. And that has been a matter of some, uh, quite a bit of, of controversy in the last six months or a year. The government, uh, Ottawa has come out and said, listen, we want to reduce the emissions of nitrous oxide by 30%. And the farmers have said, we're not quite sure how you're going to do that unless you're just saying fertilize 30% less, which will mean we'll have 30% less yields, 30% less food, and we'll have higher food prices. So that's a matter of political controversy in the news in the last, say, year. And the bottom line is, I don't think, and, and the, even the government targets don't think that there's going to be much of a reduction. Currently, we have about 73 million tons. I forecast 72, and the target is 71. So that's going to be pretty static uh, in terms of emission reduction. Okay, so this is a, this is the tough one, given the nature of the of the industry and the nature of the the emissions. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be a technology fix uh, on the horizon. So I guess uh, we'll wait to see what kind of innovations, if any, uh, the sector and the governments can come up with uh, to solve this one. But this, I think we're agreed, this is a difficult uh, yeah. sector to decarbonize. Yeah, and the only part the that they can, they could uh, decarbonize is about 10 million of that 70 tons, 72 million tons is for farm equipment, everything from tractors and harrows to propane to dry crops. And we might see electric tractors driving out in the field, and we might see electricity uh, providing heat to dry crops as opposed to propane heaters to dry crops. And that could save about 10 million tons over time. 
Sure. And that technology is still, well, it, it, well, it's in its infancy. I, I've interviewed a manufacturer of electric tractors. Uh, they're certainly coming. Uh, in fact, I just saw an announcement from John Deere the other day that they're going to be introducing an electric tractor. But we're very much at the beginning of the S-curve on the adoption for electric farm equipment. Uh, so it probably won't have a big effect, I would imagine, before 2030. Well, let's talk about the the final sector in this interview, and that is waste. What can you tell us about that? Again, most of the emissions from waste, uh, we've all, I think, at one point or another in our lives, had to put something into the dump and things decompose. And methane is one of the uh, gases that emerges as part of that decomposition. There's also other conversion of waste, which results in methane emissions. So that's going to be a real challenge to capture methane from a, a, a landfill. Now there, the methane, instead of walking around in a field, methane emitter, instead of walking around in a field on four hooves, is in one place. So the technology is, it, it's plausible to say that there's some technology that will be developed to capture the methane that comes out of place, and you can put in equipment to do that. Right now, I, I don't see anything in the next eight years between now and 2030, which is where I focused. But there is something that could be done between now and, say, 2050, uh, engineers being innovative people. Yes. Uh, uh, other, Sorry, that, that's, the, uh, that's the waste part. I'll talk about the other part in a minute. Uh, I interviewed Fortis BC about their biogas uh, program that they're introducing. They're going to be uh, putting in, in fact, there's some new subdivisions in the lower main, uh, mainland where biogas from which is essentially uh, a methane produced from uh, landfills will be introduced i think it's a 10 or 15 percent uh in some new subdivisions but the, and they they do say that as they scale it up they will be able to uh collect more of that kind of gas from from landfills but of course one of the problems is that there's just so many of them so even if you had the technology to to do that efficiently and cost effectively, uh, the, it's a problem of scale, if nothing else. Well, that's the you know engineers always ask that, or at least the business people who supervise engineers always ask that. They say that's great, engineers. That's great, inventors. You've come up with a process, engineers. You've got a little pilot project here that seems to work. Now, how are we going to scale it up to something that's uh, pragmatic, something that will have a real impact on on society? Because to go from one to a hundred is a big challenge. I mean, ramping up anything is much more difficult than actually inventing the thing in the first place. Indeed it is. Now, I said that waste was the last uh, subsector, but I was wrong. Uh, we're going to talk about land use, which is forests, wetlands, and agricultural lands. So what can you tell us about this? Well, this is the proverbial planting two billion trees. Uh, Trees act as a carbon sink. We all, I think, remember our science class where they talked about photosynthesis. Trees use carbon dioxide in the air, combine it with water, H2O, and sunlight. And the, the, that process of water plus CO2 plus energy gives us grass, trees, and everything else that's green. Uh, and so it's plausible that you could tr plant more trees than you harvest. In other words, plant more trees than you cut down and turn into lumber or pulp or whatever else you use trees for. And so you could actually have a negative amount of negative emissions. Now in the year 2019, in fact, you looked at all of the, not only the tree, the forestry, but also the agricultural lands and the wetlands, which also absorb uh, carbon dioxide. And in fact, they emitted 10 million tons in the year 2019. Now, the target that the uh, government of Ottawa has put forward is that that plus 10 will go to a minus 30 in the year 2030. Uh, my model says, I think that's a bit optimistic, but I think it will go from plus 10 to minus 15. So that, that, that will be, there will be some carbon emissions taken out of the atmosphere th through land use. Um, Brian, what role do wildfires play in the calculation of emissions from, from forestry? Because, uh, you know, mature trees at some point the tree becomes a it, it's a carbon sink and it can't it can't uh, 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 sequester any more carbon but if you if that tree is burnt in a wildfire uh, some of that carbon uh, maybe a great deal of it is released and yes. of course we've seen wildfires getting worse in western Canada uh, in particular as uh, the average temperatures go up uh, what role will that play in these calculations 
Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, the chemical reaction is that when you burn wood, it uh, releases CO2. In fact, when you have a wood fall in the forest and decompose, it releases CO2. But the burning, yes, does release CO2. So obviously for just pure CO2 reasons, you'd like to avoid forest fires. There's obviously a lot of other reasons why you want to avoid forest fires. And um, I'm not sure to be candid when they keep score. And I always say that scorekeeping is an important thing in this whole process. I'm not sure if they count the CO2, when I say they, they, Ottawa, they, the National Inventory Report, counts CO2 released by burning trees from forest fires. They count if you uh, cut down trees and they count if trees are, if there's no longer any trees planted, but I'm not sure if they count forest fires, but the, 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 the engineer or the scientist, whatever in me says, uh, CO2 is CO2 is CO2, regardless of whether it was emitted by cutting down a tree or having it burn up. Now, I want to wrap up our conversation, Brian, with uh, just a couple of questions. And one came from some feedback I got on social media when I was posting your your previous interviews, which is the uh, the government's targets and your estimation of the shortfall is about 30 percent. And uh, one experienced policymaker came back and said, yeah, that's usually what it is. That's when we're talking about these kinds of policy usually falls about 30 percent and then the governments are forced to amend it and and bring in, you know, other kinds of regulations and and incentives, whatever it might be, uh, to make up that that shortfall. Uh, what what would your uh, take be on that? Well, I, I guess I would answer by saying the whole purpose or the whole reason I did this is to try to get some numbers out there so people have a, a factual uh, basis for, for talking about things. And if, if the current state of uh, play, so to speak, which is what I try to do in my bottom-up uh, process, factual-based process, says that you're going to be 140 million tons short, which is, whatever, if that's the 30% he's referring to, fair enough. Uh, now you have to say, okay, what do we have to do in order to uh, change that 140? And if the governments look at this and go, geez, I guess we better be a little more realistic or else we better do some more things. Uh, and by the way, they should, uh, A, be doing what I'm doing and, and ex being very transparent and showing what they think the numbers will be. And B, they should be saying, all right, here's the shortfall. Here are the very specific action items that we're going to do. I mean, announcing programs, with all due respect, doesn't do things. It's just talking about doing things. I, I had a teacher once who told me, he said, Brian, don't talk about it, do it. And so I would say that governments should come out and say, all right, here are the actual actionable items that we're going to do in order to make these numbers better. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, you know, in this space, we've talked a lot about the necessity of more economic modeling, more mo modeling of emissions too, I guess that would apply. And the fact that they should be made public and transparent so that other modelers, uh, other experts can have a look at them, challenge the assumptions and have that that kind of a discussion. It can't, it shouldn't be going on behind closed doors. And I always look to the Americans, the tremendous amount of modeling they do down there, particularly out of their, na their those national laboratories. Uh, they do, the, those uh, do a lot of modeling and it's very useful for policymakers to have that kind of data uh, when they're making policy. And if you, uh, it, I don't know how you make policy in the absence of that data and modeling. Yeah. Uh, Mark, one, la one last point that I'll make. You know, if I were in charge, if that's the right word to use, I would say we're going to make uh, a concerted effort to use the technology known as direct air capture. There's a company called Carbon Engineering that has been doing it. Occidental Petroleum in the U.S. is proposing to build these direct air capture plants. And each plant, if they're built, would, would take out one million tons of, uh, of CO2 directly from the air, literally from the air that you and I breathe. And if you built 70 of them, and that's what Occidental Petroleum is, is proposing to do in the next uh, 12 or 13, 12 years, you take out 70 million tons. Well, you know, 70 million tons here, 70 million tons there, pretty soon you're talking real emission reduction. Now that will take what I call uh, a Manhattan uh, project style uh, effort. You know, one that says, listen, we're gonna put a whole bunch of people and put the sh their shoulders to the wheel and put our, uh, put our efforts behind it. We as governments will be a, a a prime mover uh, to do things. I mean, like AECL, I, I used to do nuclear engineering. AECL started the whole nuclear engineering concept and uh, electrical uh, generation concept. You mentioned nuclear in Canada um, about 60, 70 years ago, well before there were any plants, nuclear plants here in this country. But they took the initiative and they took the risk. And frankly, they spent the money because they said, 
we can't expect people to take any initiative until there's at least a, a start and a, a, a good target in place that people say, hey, now it's realistic to start investing money and to build these things. So that's what I, I think needs to happen. And if I were advising the government, that's what I would advise them to do. Well, this is that's a very appropriate uh, comment, Brian, because what we're talking about now is return. And there's a big discussion about this at the federal level. And you're seeing it in other countries where it's it's being implemented. And that is industrial policy. And one important aspect of industrial policy is that the state, whether it's a federal government or provincial governments, invests in early stage research and in early stage technology and gets it, de-risks it to the point where the private sector can then come in and say, okay, now we can scale this up and commercialize it. And so the direct air capture would be a very good example of industrial policy at work if they did what you uh, just described. But I, I want to focus in on, on a point about that's directly related to the scale up of direct air capture if that were to happen. And that's that, A, you need the supply of the uh, direct air capture technology. Uh, so you'd have to scale up the, the factories that produce them. And we've already seen in, in previous interviews, we're talking about, we can't do that with electric vehicles. We can't do that with uh, some of, with heat pumps. We can't, get it man we can't get them built quick enough. So that would be a problem. And the second is it would take a tremendous amount of, of clean, renewable, uh, reasonably priced electricity and that means we have to scale our electricity systems even more, perhaps, than the two to three times that economists have estimated needs to be done by 2050. So fixing one thing also has implications for other parts of the energy system that we need to be cognizant of. Yeah, and you mentioned electricity. I'll mention two things. Small modular reactors, you said earlier that they're building one just uh, beside the Darlington plant. Uh, east of Oshawa in uh, in Ontario. Uh, each one of those in theory, more in theory, uh, the nameplate capacity is 300 megawatts. You build 20 of those, you got 6,000 megawatts of, of not only generating capacity, but a dependable baseload uh, de uh, generating capacity. You mentioned uh, solar and wind. Alberta, even six years ago, I wrote a paper for the School of Public Policy six years ago that talked about electricity. And at that time, there was no zero solar and maybe 1,500 megawatts of, elect of wind. Today, as we speak, if you go to the AESO website, you can see there's about 3,500 megawatts of wind and over 1,000 megawatts of solar. And that was done and that was created because the government of the day in 2016 put out this thing called the Renewable X, X Electricity Program that said, we will guarantee you a price of electricity if you go out and build a solar or wind facility. Now, all of you out there, Bid a price, we the government will pick the lowest price and we'll give you that guaranteed price and you'll build it and look what's happened in a period of six years. So stuff like that works. Indeed. And I, I think uh, I'll, I'll close this interview, Brian, with this, with this thought is that we have technology that works and technology that will work. It, it would, you know, the technology that works is, is a safe bet, as uh, economists say. And the technology that, that has a lot of promise is a wild card, but we should still keep investing in it. SMRs and, and direct air capture, all of those. We should still uh, do that. And we have policy that works. The problem that we often have is getting all of that to work together efficiently, cost effectively, and to get to where we need to go. That seems to be uh, a, a difficult nut to crack. In Canada and other jurisdictions, uh, to be to be fair, it's not an e it's easy for us to talk about it, uh, but in practice, it isn't quite that easy. Brian, thank you very much for all your insights. It's been a fascinating series of interviews. Thanks very much, Markham. Glad to be here.